Hello again, this is James Merrigan at Things Screen Podcast. And uh, what is great about this setup is that it allows me to come in here on a whim and discuss something um, that has really excited me. So there's an element of urgency to this project. Uh, the setup is here, I don't have to do that much. Uh, I have a webcam attached to this cage that you can't see, of course, and it uh, it is attached to the top of the cage and then looks down at the books that are um, set on this pegboard here. If you've seen uh, an episode before, you'll see the setup. But uh, these are the two books I'm going to discuss today. Um, well, I'm really going to discuss this book uh, because I read it this morning. Um, it's only 50 pages long, so it took me just over an hour to read it. Uh, you can see the title of it there, An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris. Um, this edition was published in 2010. It's a beautiful edition, um, but I'll get into that in a, mo in, in, a, in, a mo in a moment. This book here is what I'm reading at the moment, and it's 700 pages plus. It's a biography of George Perec uh, by David Bellas, um, and I've only started it. Um, I don't know where I am. I'm only here. So I'm only something like 20, 25 pages in. But it's very extensive. Uh, it goes all back, all the way back into his family history, uh, into the 1800s actually, and then works its way up. Uh, but Bellas um, is a Perec scholar really, or he's passionate about George Perec. Um, He's actually also involved in this, well, true, uh, as in an advisory capacity with the translator. So, if you haven't come across George Perec, um, I came across him a few years ago. I've read some of his shorter novels, um, and his masterpiece is called um, Life, a User's Manual, and that's something like 600 pages. But this book here was written about two years before his masterpiece. And um, it's really, it's a beautiful book uh, in a way because it's modest. Um, he's doing something that I'm actually trying to do now uh, um, in terms of trying to describe things rather than analyze them. So with George Perec, he, he puts up constraints uh, when he's about to write something. So they're kind of, he works in a kind of project way, very much like an artist, uh, like a contemporary artist now, artists who work uh, through projects and try and set up constraints around that project. So there's an element of control um, all artists have to do this really within their studio or the choices they make. There's an element of constraint and George Perec uses that for every novel. Uh, and he sets up some kind of, um, it's like a dare. So one of his novels, uh, he doesn't use the word, the letter E throughout. So that's, that's just an example of what he does with constraints. Another writer who I'm very much a fan of is David Foster Wallace. And why I bring him up is because in comparison to George Preck, I don't think David Foster Wallace put up any constraints, really. Now he did in his short stories, but I don't think he did in his novel writing. The only constraint he had was his editor. Uh, and looking at some you know, I've looked at some things on YouTube uh, where editors, editors talk about David Foster Wallace and the job of editing him. And it was always difficult because the amount he wrote uh, and the reasoning behind what he wrote, um, which was also in a sense rule bound, but there was no constraint in relation to the length um, there was no brevity in David Foster Wallace. So it's much more explicit 
explicit in George Perec, who puts up constraints around the act of writing. Um, so if you see the cover here, uh, it's quite an eccentric cover and you get a sense of him on the cover. He also, there's an element of play or more than an element of play in George Perec. He is playing with language. He's having fun. Um, whereas in someone like David Foster Wallace, uh, like a writer coming out of the 90s, rather than this book was written in the 70s uh, in Paris, you know, you have post-structuralism and you have all this uh, stuff going on. Um, David Foster Wallace is kind of more uh, looking towards this idea of sincerity, you know, a post-irony space in which he can be sincere. There's also an element of, of play in David Foster Wallace in relation to language and, and slang, but he's obsessed with words and vernaculars and dialects. Um, and George Perec for me is a kind of a precursor to David Foster Wallace. Um, but there's something genius about George Perec. There was about David Foster Wallace as well, but we're talking about, I suppose, the genius and how, how a genius tries to constrain. Um, I think, you know, David Foster Wallace says something like, there's too much, the problem is there's too much to write on. There's too much to describe. So enter George Perec's attempt at, a, at a, exhausting a place in Paris. Now, this book is strange because I got it only during the week and I was really excited by it, but then I opened it and you will see that, now here's my notes, but these, this is the back page and it's inverted. So um, I'm not sure if it's a mistake, it's some kind of quirk. It's a lemon uh, in that the cover is fine. It's all up the right way. And then when you go in beyond the binding, you find that the book is upside down and backwards. So you have to go this way, flip it. And you open it up here on the first few pages. Uh, so there's the back and there's the first few pages. Um, so I, I don't know what I didn't look to research this because I was too eager to talk about it. But I'm not sure if it's a design flaw or it's um, it is part of the, the, the design. Um, so you get the book itself. So you see the cover here um, you see pigeons, you see traffic lights, you see a bench. Um, I'll kind of try and get up those here. It's a beautiful little edition. Um, and it's very simple. There's an afterword in it by the translator. And in a way, it takes away from the novel because I find this myself when you're talking about art. And I think this is an artwork rather than a novella. It's an experiment, uh, in a way, a failed one as well. But um, when you get something, someone writing on something like this, which is modest, it has no affect, you know, language in it. There's no metaphorical language in uh, George Perec's descriptions. And that's all he's doing here. He's describing a scene from uh, a series of cafes that are looking out onto this square in Paris and the language isn't affected and it's very simple and he's just trying to track things so it feels that he's writing uh, while looking and he doesn't have time to bring in uh, affected language such as metaphor so, that, so throughout his clean of that where what you get in the afterward um, is a kind of unaffected language where there's uh, reference points to other writers, other influences. Uh, and it feels that it's, um, it's too much for an, a novel like this or an artwork like this to bear. Sometimes I think when I'm writing on art, 
I'm just in a way appropriating it. Uh, I'm, I'm taking an artwork and I'm appropriating it uh, uh, for my own needs, my own desires. And I'm not, I'm not thinking about an audience or a readership. I'm just using it as a tool to make something else that has some kind of equivalency. You know, the Greeks called it ekphrasis, where something was transcribed, translated into something else. In particular, artworks uh, translated into words. Uh, but there had to be equivalency, um, uh, in ter like in a way, a kind of um, a weighing of the scales, you know, the justice scales, where things were in balance. And so the, the equivalency, the equal sign between the two things. So in a way, any introduction, any preface to a thing like this is too much because the, the language itself is not affected in that way. So there's my notes. The only make up one page at the back. And um, so I'll bring it back around. So there's not much to see in the center. All I will say is that um, each, there's three days, day one, and you can see the date, the 18th of October, 1974, 10.30 a.m. Location, Tabak, St. Sulpus. Weather, dry, cold, gray sky, some, some sunny spells, and that's it. And then you have these kind of inventories at the beginning of it, uh, outlining certain things in the space that should be listed, or perekfeld that needed to be listed at the beginning for the reader to actually continue on in a more abbreviated style. So um, what you get in Perek is the first day, it's, he's describing everything. The second day, he's got fed up of describing books or, or buses passing by, you know, buses going to a certain place, the number of a bus going to a certain place. So he starts to abbreviate that over time. He gets fed up. And by the third day, it's kind of a very empty space. Um, and he's tired. He's jaded uh, through this description, this relentless description. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot recently in relation to description. And I, I remember being really interested in it when I read uh, Susan Sontag's essay Against Interpretation, which um, talks about uh, or discusses the possibility of leaving analysis, whether it's Freudian or Marxist analysis behind and just describing artworks. Um, like she says at the very end, um, she wants an erotics of art, uh, rather this, you know, laying on more and more stuff uh, on top of an artwork, which can't really bear it, you know, especially in relation to words. Um, so, you know, Sontag says something like, a thing is a thing, not what is said of a thing. I said this before, I think when I was introducing this podcast, but a thing is a thing, not what is said of a thing. This is really strange coming from an intellectual like Sontag, um, a brilliant intellectual who was wrapped up in Freudian and Marxist and post-structuralist theory um, and in her own writing analyzed, you know. Uh, but I feel in that essay, and it's a very, it's a young Sontag, Sontag writing in this way that she was trying is there's a kind of a self critique or um, she was outlining the possibility of just describing an artwork rather than analyzing it uh, and trying to find the truth the Freudian truth behind the symptom of the artwork so <clears throat> what did I write in the back here so there's parts in this okay that jump out but because of all the descriptions uh, and they're very limited and limiting descriptions throughout um, you kind of are looking for something more you're looking for a metaphor which you don't get you're looking for suspense and you don't get towards the end this cop is moving around the square and Parekh keeps on 
um, picking him out uh, in the crowd and is wondering where this cop is going and why is he walking up and down. And you feel that all of a sudden Parekh has been um, caught looking uh, and that this cop is going to confront him. But he, he, he never does. He just, it just ends very abruptly. It's like um, Parekh went, that's it. I can't do this anymore. So there's three days of this looking. Uh, Parekh moving or uh, roving around between cafes, uh, having a brandy here and a brandy there and a coffee and a tea here. And he's moving about from around 10.30 in the morning till the evening time when the, when the lights come on in, in the city. And there's not much to see because the square is a space of transition. Buses passes through, tourists pass through, lots of Japanese tourists in the 70s in Paris moving through, and people walking their dogs, Buses upon buses upon buses. Um, he says this lovely thing where he's describing the space around. And he talks about how the sky uh, makes up about a sixth of his vision, a chunk of sky. So you get these moments of poetry, but they're very minimal. Um, so there's something about he, he even he catches this guy on page 12 just pick out this a few little sections okay so right by the cafe at the foot of the window and at three different spots a fairly young man draws a sort of V on the sidewalk with chalk with a kind of question mark inside it land art so I'm gonna pick out something else orange okay so I've only written down abbreviated notes here so I don't know what I've actually written in the urgency to get this out so uh, he, he calls this he, he has this uh, little short sentence Rue Bonaparte a cement mixer orange that's the description so he started to get a sense um, he has moments of reflection Okay, so he pulls away from the describing uh, as if kind of there's an anxiety and a frustration around this describing. So he also describes the birds beautifully. So page 16. Um, again, the pigeons go around the square. What triggers off this unified movement? It doesn't seem linked to any exterior stimulus, explosion, detonation, change in light, rain, etc. Nor to any particular motivation. It seems completely gratuitous. The birds suddenly take flight, go around the square and return to settle on the district council's building's gutter. It is 2.20. Um, Page 15, obvious limits, I've noted. So, obvious limits to such an undertaking. Even when my only goal is just to observe, I don't see what takes place a few meters from me. I don't notice, for example, that cars are parking. So he starts to reflect on his own uh, act of describing and what he's missing and you feel in Parekh and David Foster Wallace there's a real fear of missing something uh, missing a point of view and that's why the language becomes so maximal that they the language gets so clotted and in this one, in a way, it doesn't because um, he has abbreviated beautifully in a kind of poetic way. He's covering the world like poets do, uh, how they kind of compress the wor world into three uh, words. There's one part where Paul Virilio passes by, the philosopher, uh, and I thought, 
I thought I misread it or something. But in the afterward, the translator talks about Paul Virilio uh, uh, in Paris and how he makes an appearance. Uh, and this is intentional. It's not, it's not, some, it's not something that Parekh has imagined. So he walks by uh, as a passerby. Like he's talking about why count buses, page 22. Why count buses? Probably because they're recognizable and regular. They cut up time, they punctuate the background noise. Ultimately, they're foreseeable. The rest seems random, improbable, anarchic. The buses pass by because they have to pass by, but nothing requires a car to back up or a man to have a bag marked with M of monoprix or a car to be blue or apple green or a customer to order a coffee instead of a beer. Like it's, uh, I love it. I love it because uh, I'm in this space now where I'm thinking about doing um, a zine or I'm thinking about calling it in-person review. So it'll be a zine and a podcast. And it will start to, I will start to go out and review exhibitions in person as following COVID, of course, this, I, this word in person. You know, the last journal I did when I started in 2010 was called Billion Journal. And I used the word billion for no other reason uh, than the word billion was ubiqui ubiquitous everywhere. Everyone was talking about billions uh, following the recession and the financial crash. So for me, the word in person is the word of the moment. Uh, people use it all the time, a word that they probably have never used before. So um, I'm thinking about doing this thing where um, I review uh, exhibitions, but leaning on description rather than analysis, something that I am wrapped, in, up, in, wrapped up in as someone who re re reads and lectures in psychoanalysis. I want to find a kind of counter to that. And I'm really excited by thinking about the things in themselves. Um, so there's something that something about the translator says actually in the afterword that is really interesting and he talks about how this book is an inversion uh, of Parekh's masterpiece which came two years later uh, and I was thinking about how the inside of the book is inverted in relation to the cover um, and I don't know why I haven't read Parekh's 600 page magnus opus but um, it's something I'm going to do after I read the biography, which is a weird way to go about it. But uh, I have the biography here, so I'm going to start to kind of go through Parekh uh, and engage with him in a, in a fuller way. Um, but he says, uh, he says about Parekh that Parekh said this, what happens when nothing happens? So this is one of the motivations for Parekh to go to this Parisian terrace, this square uh, and exhaust something. Uh, which is every day, which not, nothing dramatic is happening. And, and how can you bring something entertaining out of that? Or can there be entertainment here? Is it all like ennui? Is it something that uh, will, there's an element of sadness or misery to doing something like this? Uh, a lack of hope. And this is another word that's been popping up a lot in relation to COVID. That there's an element of sadness, melancholy, a dragging on like melancholy is you know in Freudian terms something that is uh, is unre unresolved that it continues on into infinity it drags you down and uh, there's no that horrible word closure to melancholy it just pulls you down it keeps on pulling so there is an element of sadness to this and but when you relate it to the afterward by the translator there's something pure about it because when I was reading the afterward, I was going, oh God, it felt so affected, the language. The writer, the translator was too concerned with how things were being said. 
So in Parak, when he's describing a bus, this one, this kind of style of writing or this project, what it allows Parak to do at some point is that in the beginning, he's talking about the buses and he's listing them and he's saying, oh, the A26 or the A64 uh, and is going to a certain place. But midway through the book, he's just saying A26, A24. You know, he's abbreviating things down because the reader already at this point has got the gist, doesn't need any more information. So it, a, it goes from a kind of a maximal description, uh, a kind of a joy, um, a purpose at the beginning. Uh, the writer is wrapped up in the scene, it's new, uh, there's adrenaline pumping. But by the time we get to the end, um, there's an element of melancholy and sadness uh, and being fed up. Um, page 36. I'll just, I'll end with this. So, oh, these two things, I'm going to end with these two things, okay? So it's page 36 at the very bottom. You see how I've marked them there? Okay, so one description is a bus, Japanese. So that's, he's, he's repeated over and over again how many Japanese people are on these buses passing through the square. So by the page 36 of about 50 pages, he just says a bus, Japanese. There's something really funny about this one uh, at the very bottom of this page, 36. A little girl flanked by her parents or by her kidnappers is weeping. So, um, and then he starts using words like this for the, and there's a bit of frustration in this one. Um, I've highlighted there for the umpteenth time, the 79 Rue de Rennes auto driving school car goes by. Okay. I'm going to end it there. Um, I would really recommend them as a writer. Uh, these two books, this, this one knows of awards. It's seen as one of the best biographies of any artist out there. Um, so, so um, I'll leave it there and thanks for listening.